thanks very much. Uh, it's great to be here. I really appreciate the invitation. Um, I wanted to just start out by asking, dude, no, I don't actually want to. <laughs> um, I want you to imagine a situation that you've probably been in before. This is actually something that happened to me just a couple days ago. You're walking along, and somebody stops you and asks you for directions. They want to know how to get to the bank, for instance. And you don't even need to think about it, right? You just say, oh, you just go, you go right down to Gervais, and you take a right, and you'll be there in just a couple of blocks. And that's it. They thank you, and they go on your way, on their way, and you go on your way. Everything's, everything's fine. You don't really even give it any thought, right? You would be, there would be a problem if you had to stop and ask yourself, hmm, how do I deal with this? Should I tell them the truth or not? And yet, it seems to me that we can use this example as the starting point for some reflections on a number of important values that have a relationship to questions of truth-telling and the opposite of telling the lies and the virtue of honesty and to the vice of dishonesty. And so that's what we're going to do for the next 15 or so minutes. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of philosophy, but as they say, it will only hurt for a minute. <laughs> um, you help this guy out, right? He needs something, and you offer it to him. You give him something that is of benefit to him. And so you might go home and tell yourself, well, I've done my good deed for the day. And when you put it that way, then it seems to us that maybe, you know, it was optional. We might have done the good deed, or we might have decided not to do the good deed. It was just a good deed. It was charity, we might say. I think that's a mistake. I think we should think of this in terms of the idea of justice. Justice is giving somebody else what you owe them. It's giving somebody what's due to them. And it seems to me that if somebody has a need, and it's a need that you can satisfy, and it's not going to be harmful to you, to satisfy it, then you probably do owe that person the satisfaction of the need. If somebody shows up at your doorstep and they're starving and they need something to eat or they are going to die and you have plenty of food, you probably owe them food. And that's probably how we should think about our relationship as an affluent country between ourselves and countries and peoples who are less affluent. It's a matter of justice. It's not just a matter of doing a good, good deed. And so when somebody comes to you in this circumstance, and ask you for this information, when you tell them what it is that they need, then you're actually doing justice. You have the opportunity to do justice, and you do it. And if you don't do it, then you fail to do justice. You've acted in an unjust way. And so it seems to me in many circumstances, when we're asked a question and we can respond truthfully, or we can respond without the truth, we have actually been given an opportunity to do justice. And we can either seize that opportunity and act justly, or we can fail and act unjustly. So, this is an opportunity to do justice, but I think it's an opportunity to do something else as well. So, think about what else you give that person when that person asks you for the directions. It's true that you give information, but it seems to me that you give something else as well. There's something that that person doesn't know that you, that he then comes to know by your telling him the truth, and that is your mind. Right? We're not mind readers. Sometimes we can tell what other people are thinking, even if they're not communicating to us. If I'm teaching in class and I see this, then I know, I know what's going on, right? I, but they're not telling me. They're not communicating to me. Somebody comes up to me after class and says, you know, it was pretty good, but it wasn't your best. You could have done better. I know something about their mind now because they've communicated it to me. They've told me something about themselves by telling me about something else. If you think about it, at the end of today, one thing that a lot of you might say to various of the speakers, you might say, thanks for sharing, right? And you won't mean it sarcastically, it won't be, thanks for sharing, right? They are sharing. They're telling you about the world, they're telling you about what they know, but in doing that, they're also telling you something about themselves, right? They're telling you about their mind, what they think, what they believe. Why is that important? Well, think about the value of community or the good of friendship. Where does that start? Where does community start? Where does friendship start? I don't think you can be a friend with somebody that you don't know. How is it that you get to know somebody in order to become friends with them? There has to be some initial moment of communication. They have to tell you something about themselves, and they have to do it for real. They have to be honest in doing that. If they give you a fake self, then you're not really going to be able to be friends with that person. A community that's based on them, falsity, is no real community at all. And so if we go back to our guy, I, I say to him, hey, you go up to the and then you take a right and you go two blocks. And he, I've offered him something. Right? I've offered him something both about the world and also about me. If he accepts that, if he trusts me, 
Okay? Then we have the beginnings of the community. It's a short-lived community because he's going to go his way, and I'm going to go my way. But it's real. There's that trust, there's a giving, there's a receiving. Okay? If there's not the trust, there's no community. If he thinks to himself, hmm, bald guy, can't trust him. <laughs> we don't really have anything going, me and that person, for a variety of reasons. Right? Uh, but if I offer him the information and he accepts it, he's accepting something not just about the world, but something about me. And I would like to call that the primordial act of community. It's the first act of community. Community begins with this kind of giving of oneself in communication and the receiving of that from somebody else. And so when you're, you have an opportunity to communicate somebody with somebody, you have an opportunity to tell somebody something, in the same way that you have an opportunity to do justice or injustice, you have an opportunity to either begin or to foster or to further community and friendship. You also have the opportunity to do the opposite. If I start to tell you something, and it's not for real, it doesn't truly represent my mind, then even if you think, that we've established the beginning of a community between the two of us, or the 50 of us. It's not real. The guy goes up to Gervais and takes a, you know, takes a right, and in two blocks he finds nothing. He's going to think, wow, I was really misled. There was nothing in between us. So this opportunity to communicate not only gives us the opportunity for justice, but also the opportunity for beginning community. Now in that example that I just gave, we can also see the beginning of the distinction the distinction between our private self and our public self. What's the private self? Well, the private self is that self that people don't automatically see. It's what we're thinking. It's how we're feeling. It's, in some cases, the choices that we've made. What's the public self? The public self is the way that private self gets realized out in the public world for other people to become aware of, for other people to recognize. And we make that private self public through what we do, through the actions that we perform, we make it public through how we dress. Right? People give some thought in the morning, I'm sure here, to how they're going to dress because they think that it's going to express themselves or fail to express themselves. And we also make that private self public in how we communicate with other people. Now, if you think about this distinction between the private self and the public self, then you can probably recognize, at least I can recognize, that there are ways in which those two selves can start to get apart. They can start to come apart at the seams, as it were. Has anybody here ever had the experience of thinking to themselves, I really ought to do that, and then you don't do that? No, nobody here. <laughs> I've had that experience. I'll just tell you. Okay, take it from me. Maybe if somebody here has had the experience of thinking to themselves, I really should not do that, and then you do it. Right? Also bad. I'm sure nobody here has ever done that. What do we describe these experiences as? I think we, we call them failures of integrity. Right? We want that public self to be in line with the private self. We want there to be a unity between who we are and who we think of ourselves, and how we present that self to the world. Now that unity of public and private can come apart not just between our choices and our actions, or how we think we are and how we appear to others, but also between how we are and how we communicate ourselves to others. When I communicate to you, when I'm telling you what I'm telling you right now, or if you ask me a question and I give you an answer, I have my own thought about what it is that I'm talking about. And if I present that thought in a way that is at odds with what I really believe, then my public self and my private self are starting to come apart in the same way that the person who thinks I should never do that and then they go ahead and do it. It's a failure of integrity. And so, just as we have an opportunity to do justice, and also we have an opportunity to foster community, we also have an opportunity to foster and bring about our own integrity. And likewise, we have an opportunity to fail in that. We can fail to be persons of integrity in the way that we communicate to others when we communicate falsely. Now, everything that I've said so far, in some ways, might seem like it's less obvious than the most obvious thing that you can think is at stake in your decision about how to communicate with another person. You might think, what is the most obvious thing that is at stake in that decision? And it's a word that's come up repeatedly in what I've said so far. You can say, well, it's obviously truth. Right? What matters is truth here. If you're lying, right, there's some sense in which what you're saying is obviously at odds with that value. Plato says that the person who loves truth, who's committed to truth, lying would be just repugnant to that person. They, they can't even think about why somebody would want to do it. It's so opposed to truth, they would never want to do that. Well, why should we 
Why do you get into the truth in that way? In the way that Plato describes as a love. He's a philosopher is somebody who really loves the truth. Well, maybe not everybody's going to be a philosopher. I want to give you three reasons. I'm going to give you three reasons why I think you should be committed to the truth. One is that you're human beings. Um, Robert has already quoted Aristotle. This is going to be the first TEDx event, it seems to me, where Aristotle is quoted twice. Aristotle <laughs> says, all human beings, by their nature, des desire to know. Well, knowledge is of the truth. Right? You don't really know if what you have a grip, grip, on, a grip, grip on is not the truth. Right? Knowledge is of the truth. And so if what it means to be a human being, if Aristotle is right, means that you should have that desire for truth, then you should be committed to that. It's part of what your essence as a human being is. Here's the second reason why I think that you should be committed to truth. Most of the people here are students. The word for student comes from the word for what? Anybody know? It's, it's really almost built right in there. The so student is somebody who does what? Study. They study. That's exactly right. And study is for the sake of what? It's for the sake of learning. And learning involves knowledge. And knowledge, as we've already seen, is related to truth. You don't have learning. Not book learning or any other kind of learning if you're not coming to grips with the truth. And you're not studying if you're not involved in an inquiry for the sake of truth. And so a commitment to truth follows not just from your nature as a human being, but also from your more specific nature as a student. I want to give a third reason why I think that everybody here should be committed to truth. I'm going to assume, I think reasonably, given who I'm talking to, that you were all a fairly idealistic group of people. I doubt that you would be here if you weren't. And I think if we took a poll of everybody here, we'd find that there are a number of people here who think of themselves in one way or another as committed to something that they see as a very important and good cause. Some sort of social cause that they think of as important to themselves and important to what they're going to do. And they think, rightly, that an important part of their life is going to be bringing about the necessary change so that what they see as good will eventually come to characterize the world that they live in. And it's not going to be easy because there might be people who disagree with you. There are going to be all kinds of obstacles. Seems to me you've already heard, right, a number of instances of the kind of obstacles that people need to overcome, that people come up against, and they need help in overcoming these. Well, why is truth important to that? Think about the commitment that a great figure like Martin Luther King, Jr. had to a social cause, to the elimination of racism. Did he want the law to be on his side? Yes, he did. Did he want people's behavior to be on his side? Yes, he did. But did he just want that? Did he just want there to be a state of affairs in which everybody was acting and the law was causing to act people in a way that conformed to how he thought things should be? No. It seems to me that's not what he wanted at the end of the day. He wanted something more than that. He wanted the law to reflect what was true because it was true. And he wanted people's behavior to match what was true because it was true. He didn't want people to be forced, although if necessary, under some circumstances, some people might have needed to be, to be, to act in just ways with other, others. He wanted them to behave in just ways with others because they themselves came to be committed to principles of racial equality, because they themselves came to recognize those principles as true. It seems to me that's essential to any important social cause. You don't just want to bring about a world in which everybody is doing what you think they should be you want to bring around about a world in which people do the right thing because they recognize it's the right thing. Whatever your cause is, you want that to change the world, not by force and not by manipulation, but by the power of truth. And when you lie, and people are tempted to lie in service of good causes, just as they're tempted to use violence in service of good causes. When you lie, I think you jeopardize the very goal that you have, the goal of bringing about that change because it's the right change, because it reflects the truth of the matter. And so just as you have an opportunity right, with regard to justice and community and integrity, you also have an opportunity to forward the good causes that you yourselves are committed to, or in a way to thwart those ahead of time by undermining the very plank, the plank of truth on which your commitment is grounded. And so what I want to suggest to you, what I want to suggest is, is the truth of the matter, <clears throat> is that all of you should be committed to justice. I think that's the truth. 
and all of you could, should be committed to community and to friendship, to initiating and furthering forms of community and friendship. And all of you should have a commitment to integrity. You should also have a commitment to the good causes that you think are essential to bringing about a better world. But what I'd like to leave this talk and this day right, reflecting a little bit about is the way that a commitment to truth is the fundamental commitment that undergirds all of those other commitments. And beings, both individually and together. Thank you very much.